When Mark Ferrant was called to serve as a juror in a gruesome murder trial, he stepped up to perform his civic duty. What he did not anticipate were the lasting feelings of anxiety that intensified over time and led to a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. He is not alone facing such difficulty, and just this week, Ontario's Attorney General Yasser Nakvi acknowledged as much when he announced the creation of a support line for jurors. And Mark Farron joins us now for more. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for coming in tonight. I want to read this from Yasser Nakvi, the Attorney General, and then we'll uh, have a little Q&A here. Sheldon, if you would. We recognize and appreciate the vital role our jurors play in Ontario's justice system. I heard concerns from jurors who served on difficult trials and often experienced trauma as a result of graphic evidence. We want to ensure that anyone serving as a juror in Ontario has the supports they need. That is why, beginning January 2017, our government will be offering free counseling to all jurors who want it. Jurors will be able to call a designated phone number and get help whenever they need it. Let's start there. Reaction to the announcement. It, well, it's fantastic news that uh, they took it so seriously, uh, that the concern was addressed uh, with um, really lightning speed in, in my estimation. I, I didn't expect it to happen so quickly. I expected this to drag on a little longer, so I'm, I'm very relieved. Anything more beyond that that you think needs doing? Well, I, I, from what I understand that there are additional counseling services that may or may not be provided, it seems a bit vague at the moment. Um, that crisis line is definitely a, a huge step. That wasn't there for me. Um, so having at least some um, apparatus to phone into and, uh, and, and then at least be um, sent for um, other channels for help, that's, that's a huge step. You're a typically Canadian guy in as much as you're not going to take credit for this, but the fact is you put this on their radar and then they did it. Do you take some measure of satisfaction for this? Well, I, I didn't want what happened to me to happen to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole point of this exercise. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very relieved that that, that um, mechanism is in place, but I, I, it's a team effort. There's been a lot of You are so Canadian. That is such a Canadian <laughs> answer. That's good. Okay, moving on. Uh, you said you didn't want to put, you don't want anybody else in the future to be put in the position that you were in, and that's what I want to find out about now, the position you were in. Tell us a bit about the trial you were involved with. What, what, what were they trying to find out? It was a very... Um, complicated trial for the, um, it was a um, not criminally responsible um, defense. So that in itself is a very complicated matter. Mm -hmm. So um, what is alleged to have happened? Well, it, the, it was uh, a homicide. So um, it involved the, um, really the gruesome um, murder of, um, of um, a female victim by her uh, on again, off again boyfriend. The, the attack was incredibly gruesome. Um, the question at that point was, is the defendant not criminally responsible for his actions because of mental illness? Hmm. So very similar to the Luca Magnata trial in, in almost, it's almost a carbon copy of it without the notoriety. Um, not, a, not a case that was on the radar of many media outlets. It, it really just was, it's not to say it was an ordinary case, but it didn't have any of the attention. Where did uh, it take place? Took place in Toronto. When? In uh, well, the, the crime itself actually took place in 2010, I believe. There was a, quite a long delay in the case coming to court, partly because the um, the accused was suffering from um, a lot of horrific injuries himself. So in the attack, there was a fire, and the individual suffered major burns to his body and was actually in a coma for a while, as, hmm. as I recall. Mark, I'm going to ask you some stuff, and you know, the last thing I want is you're coming in here and having to relive some of this stuff in a way that is harmful to you. Yeah. So at any time, you just say, move along, okay, if you don't want to answer this, but let's try. How long was the trial? The trial was uh, four months, um, so from January to April. You were in the jury box for four months? There were some delays in between, so um, there were periods where the um, there were some additional um, medical diagnoses required, so there were some periods where the jury was excused for um, a week or so, but we were there, yeah, we were there for a very long time, much longer than we had been told. Well, okay, that was my second question. What were you told to anticipate when you first started? About five weeks. So five weeks turned into 20. Yeah. Hmm. 
uh, you're not sequestered the whole time, right? You're going home. You're at, going home at the end of the day. Uh, I was going to work at the end of the day, so I had huh. uh, I had a lot of uh, pressure. Um, so I was going to sometimes I was going into work and working into the wee hours of the night. Um, I was, you know, and then you're yeah, you're going home at the end of the day and you're seeing horrible evidence and you're not talking about it. You are keeping tight lipped. Again, I'll be careful here, but like horrible evidence, like what? Well, you're, um, you might be seeing autopsy photos. So I certainly saw some pretty gruesome mm. autopsy photos of the, of the victim, um, the crime scene itself. How did she the, die, the victim? Well, um, she, had her, um, she had her throat slit from ear to ear. Uh, there were multiple stab wounds, and then she was set on fire. Um, and she survived her, um, you know, with respect to the victim and, the, and her family, but she, you know, uh, she survived her injuries initially, but died on the way to the hospital. Mm. So it survived the attack, I should say. Were you given any instructions before getting into that jury box, either from the Crown, from the judge, from somebody ahead of time, uh, suggesting this is going to be a gruesome trial and you better kind of steal yourself for what you're about to encounter. No. Nothing like that. No, nothing like that. Anything at all? Nope. Any No. Nope. No setup. Well, we on the summons you know that it is that it is a first degree murder trial. So it's 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 issued written into the summons itself, hmm. but that's all the evidence I had. I had no idea what I was getting involved into. Did you think about uh, not showing up for jury duty? That wasn't an option. I mean, once I mean, you're selected. Once you're selected, you're supposed to, but you can look Mark between us, I hear people sometimes any excuses so they can beg off. You didn't think about doing that? Well, I think most, I, I've said this a few times, most people when they receive a jury summons, and I was one of them, is mm -hmm. the first response you have when you get that summons is, how am I going to get out of this? Mm -hmm. I don't want to do this. It's an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think most Canadians um, have that emotion. Um, and I certainly had um, members of my extended family coming up with all kinds of fabulous excuses to get out of jury duty. And but you didn't take them? Well, I'm not going to lie in front of a judge, and I'm, uh, and you know, I I wrote down some. Uh, I did write down one particular um, uh, one particular condition at the time, which was my wife was pregnant, and we were expecting our second child, and I thought, you know, I want to be there for her, and I want to make sure that this trial doesn't uh, impede on that, and uh, I was told, I was asked by the judge if you know access to his office for my wife at the time was, uh, was going to be sufficient. So she could phone in and, and say, you know, if, if she needed access to me, the court would, uh, would uh, acquiesce. Hmm. At what point after the trial is over, do you notice something's not right with me? I noticed something was not right with me during the trial. So I, it didn't, it, it, it um, accelerated over time. Um, but certainly during the trial, I would I would wake up in cold sweats in the middle of the night. I had uh, I had some sensation of dread coming into the courtroom. Um, but again, you buckle down and you focus and you you're there to perform a duty. And I paid great detail to all of the evidence that was presented to me, all of the court proceedings, and I just I just parked those emotions. But I, I had a, a sensation during the trial. Did you tell anybody about it? Not anyone, no. How come? I just didn't think it was appropriate or, um, or uh, I, you know, I didn't think that there was anybody I could talk to about it. Uh, certainly at home I would say I saw some bad things today, but that was about as far as I went. I certainly didn't talk to any colleagues about it or mm. anyone else. Well, no. your, wife, your wife is very pregnant at the time too, right? So she's focused on other things. True. And you had a child already. And I had a child already. So you're trying to, I, you know, I just tried to focus and I tried to get through it. That's what I wanted to do. How successfully were you able to do that? Not so successfully. What, so What was the sort of the straw that broke the camel's back? It wasn't, it's a seeping effect. I think that's the best way to describe it. So it didn't, it's not one thing. It, it intensified over time. Um, I started to, after the verdict, I, um, within a month, we, were, we had our second child. And so I, um, I, you know, I was very busy and very occupied, but it, it wasn't 
um, it wasn't a happy moment, which is awful to say. It um, the birth all, of the child was not. well. The birth of the child was 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 a wonderful moment, but mm-hmm. it, I was feeling I wasn't able to partition those feelings that I had in court, mm-hmm. and so I lost a lot of time with him as a result of that um, time that I'm trying to repair now. Did your wife notice? Yep. Yep, she noticed. My family noticed, but again, it, it, it took a long time for the the um, the effects to really take hold. I, I started to withdraw from social circles um, with uh, with intensity. I my sleep patterns changed. I I was getting, and I'm still getting very little sleep. I sleep about you know three to four hours a night. Um, I suffer from. I don't have as many of the um, uh, Images as 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 I did then, as I or now as I did then. Mm-hmm. So I'm not seeing. I you know for the longest time I would walk around and see. You know the remains of an autopsy table, and I would I um, I would hold my daughter incredibly close to me wherever we went in public. Um, it uh, again, it's this it's this seeping effect mm-hmm. that uh, that takes hold. But it's changed my life. I'm not the same person coming out of that trial as I was going in. But you did get help. What happened? I, well, there was a breaking point, and uh, um, that's when my my family said, "You need to get help. You 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 cannot go on like this. There's something wrong." So you went for therapy. Well, I I <clears throat> I had to step back and say, "Well, where am I going to get that? How am I going to do this?" And that's when I started to I I thought, "Well, I'll call the courthouse. I think they'll probably be able to find the officials and and the, the proper channels." For me to uh, to um, access, and it just didn't happen. They did that. There, there was no such thing. There wasn't anyone calling me back, and there wasn't mm-hmm. anybody. And and again, they they hummed and hawed about it. They didn't really have, uh, you know, victim services are for victims, and the other services are avail- available for our first responders and the like. They're, mm-hmm. For jurors, there just didn't seem to be the right body. So. And unfortunately, I didn't have time to wait. So I was in crisis, and I had to do something about it. So mm-hmm. I, I, again, I, I called. I went to my family doctor. Um, it took a long time for me to find the right um, therapist. But you know, the, even the even the CAMH route, the the um, public route, meant a long delay because mm-hmm. I didn't have. Any of the um, uh, harm scale, I guess, is one way to call it. I wasn't going to harm myself. I wasn't um, having any of those uh, ideations. Do you know anybody else who's had it as a result of that? Well, there've been uh, through this exercise. Unfortunately, S- Steve, there's been a number of people from across the country have come forward hmm. with their stories. So, so I, I okay. know I'm not alone. And there were there were inklings in the in the media about cases where. There was potential for a jury member to have PTSD or have anxiety or have negative health effects as a result, which is what propelled me to to seek change. But at the time, I just knew there was something wrong with me. I didn't even know what the label was. I just knew that I couldn't get the thoughts out of my mind, and it was getting worse and worse and worse until it was just omnipresent. Hmm. Uh, Forgive this silly technical question, but who paid for your therapy? Me. You did. I did. So OHIP did not pick it up? No. I didn't. When did you figure out that I have to go, it's not only enough for me to get treated and try to get better, but I actually need to do something about this. I need to tell somebody about this and I need to do something about this. Well, I, I think I had, I had, um, I knew there was a gap. <laughs> that I experienced a long wait in accessing services um, from my family doctor to finding a, a clinician, it was really me doing all the legwork. So I was essentially given a list of therapists to call, and you know, going down that list, there were many of them who just said, "I I don't have experience with PTSD. I don't. It's hmm. not my subject matter area. I don't deal with that. So I wouldn't be the right person to work with you." So I'm going down this list in this process of elimination, and I'm thinking, "This is this doesn't feel right." This doesn't feel like I should be doing this. Do you think, I don't know, this will be the wrong word and you'll correct my bad language here, but 
do you expect to be cured of PTSD at some point in the future? I'm not setting expectations for myself along those lines. Um, I, I expect I'll get better, and I expect that um, I will um, be able to. I mean, I'm I'm a lot better now than I than I was. But have your has your therapist told you this is something that you will have to essentially manage for the rest of your life? Potentially, yeah. Potentially. How old are you? I'm 44. That's uh, many, many, many more years, God willing, of yeah. having to deal with this. There are things that I can't do that I that I once was able to do. Like I, what? I I can't watch violent movies anymore. Right. I can't watch. Um, I can't play video games anymore. Uh, even even benign video games give me incredible anxiety. I can't. Um, I still can't go to social settings and parties the way I used to. Are I, you on I, meds right now? I'm not on anything. No. You're I'm not on not, anything. No, I'm not okay. on any medication. I'm I'm in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, you know, I, uh, I have yet to see a, a psychiatrist because, again, I've, I'm in this waiting period. Um, so I have, a, I have an appointment, but it's a long time for now. Mark, let's finish on this. Um, Give it everything you've been through. Do you regret answering that jury duty call in the first place? I, I don't regret. Um, I don't regret doing it. I regret what happened to me. Hmm. So I, I, that's a regret. I wish it hadn't have happened to me, but maybe this is all part of a bigger picture. I don't know. But I, um, it's a civic duty. I, you know, uh, the fact is that any Canadian can be called to perform their civic duty. I've been working on this advocacy piece to ensure that there are safeguards for jurors moving forward. Well, you not only deserve our admiration for doing your civic duty, but for also making a stink about what happened to you, and therefore moving the yardsticks forward for other people. So good on you, man. Thank you very much. Mark Ferrand, former juror. Thanks so much for visiting us at TVO tonight. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.